Good evening. If you're at home with us, uh, we welcome you. And here we welcome you and uh, to our Ash Wednesday service. I'm so glad that we're able to have uh, something this year to, to do this. It's a very important um, evening and a movement into the season and uh, this time of Lent, of reflection, of recognizing who we are and whose we are. And so if you're at home, we recognize that you probably don't have ashes at your house, but if you have a bowl of water, you have some time to, to go grab a bowl of water, and we'll use that at the end uh, for remembering your baptism at home. And, uh, and for those of you here, for the imposition of ashes, I'll give instructions later in the service uh, for that. But meanwhile, we light the light of Christ to remind us the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. As we come this evening, we come with many things on our hearts. And some of us have uh, those internal voices that speak uh, cruel things to us. That say that maybe we're no good, or that we're broken, we're lost. Uh, maybe we have people that uh, seem to be antagonistic against you. Maybe you have doubts about who you are. Maybe other people might have doubts about you, but I want you to know this one thing tonight, this one thing. Rest assured of this truth, that you belong to God and God loves you. Rest in that promise. Lent is, simply means 40 days, and it is a time we do reflect on our mortality. We do reflect on sin, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later tonight. I know it's everyone's favorite topic is to talk about sin, um, but I want to say that we talk about it with liberation and hope and life and perspective, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, where God is taking us, where Jesus is leading us. And so we welcome you this evening with us. And so I'd like to begin with our greeting together. And she would uh, join me in this liturgy. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. With you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. like for you to join us in this evening's uh, opening hymn. It is in the, in the hymnal number 269, Lord, who throughout these 40 days will be doing all five verses because they speak very clearly about the story that we're about to experience during the next 40 days. Would you stand and join us, please?
I am reading from Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and verses 12 through 17. And I invite you to follow along if you have your personal Bible or perhaps the Bible on a device. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and dark darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. There like has never been from old, nor will there be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? As a reminder, I'd like to talk about the Psalter that we're about to go into. It has a singing response, which will first be sung by our cantor at the organ. And uh, then we will sing that response, and then the pastor will lead us in a responsive reading, and we'll be inserting that choral response every so often. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold... I was born in iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Behold your desire, truth in the inward being. Therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not to Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, 
and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressions your and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I, were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found within our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, as hymn number 358, we'll be singing the first, second, and fifth verses. Would you stand and join me, please? Oh! 
Our gospel reading comes from the book of Matthew, reading from chapter 6, 1 through 6, and 16 through 21. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray at the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us pray. All things come from you, O God. And with praise and thanksgiving, we return to you. What is yours? You created all that is, and with love, you formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, that we might have abundant and eternal life. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all that you have done, we offer you ourselves, and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the almighty and merciful God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit, to newness of life. Let us pray as Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Perhaps one of the greatest inventions in human history is the wheel. It's amazing what we've done with this simple shape that some of the most complex Gadgets we've created have the wheel in them, that we have used wheelbarrows to be able to transport water from one place to another. As a matter of fact, we used the wheel for a long time to twist in the rivers to bring water up, to transport and move water from one location to the other. We've used wheels in order to build the pyramids. It is an amazing thing what the wheel has done, this incredible thing. A square wouldn't work. If you've ever tried to roll a square... I have, because I'm not the brightest. A triangle wouldn't work. It's too pointy. Even the wonderful oval that might look like a wheel, sort of like a, a wheel that needs to go on a diet and 
It's just sort of stretched and oblong. It, it doesn't work. It needs to be circular. The circle, it's a wheel. It's a magnificent thing that we've done and what we can do. But it's amazing, though, that the wheel, if it's on your bicycle and it's flat, you ever try to ride a bicycle on a flat tire? It's not fun. Have you ever tried to ride a bicycle when the rim is twisted and misshapen and you've had no place to go or been in a situation where you're trying to ride a bicycle that didn't have the rubber tires on it? The wheel gets misshapen and torn and it's out of shape. If the spokes, the center of the wheel matters too because if you have your center here on the end, you get something wobbly and you never know quite what the prediction is. If you're on a bad road and the wheel is off-center, that all the spokes are different and misaligned, you're going to have quite a bumpy ride anyways. And then, with that, if you have a gravel and already bumpy road, it's going to be a nightmare. If you've ever driven with a flat tire on a gravel road, you know this as well. The center must be there, right in the middle, and I'm hesitant to turn this as it the center must be there to go in nice, smooth order. If the center doesn't hold, the wheel becomes useless. It needs to be balanced and coordinated to work like a wheel is supposed to work. We spend a great deal of our life trying to be balanced. Keeping our lives under control, we have our internal narratives that we keep that help navigate that tightrope of our life, of trying to stay centered in whatever the case might be. What is our center is the big question. Some of the stories that we have are good and some are dangerous. What we don't like to do is to air uh, the dirty laundry in our lives. We don't like to look at the sin in our lives. We're ready to say other people have sins, uh, but uh, not me. Even though we secretly know that we do, we don't want to admit that. We don't want to look too closely. It's easier to cast judgment on others. It's easier to despair others. It's easier to look at other people's work instead of our own. We don't like to look at that. It's not that we think that we're perfect or better than. It's just that those are pains in our life we'd rather not touch. And so much so that talking about sin makes us very uncomfortable. Um, and, and some people get worried that oh, all church talks about is sin because then it becomes something of condemnation. That, that's what we're afraid that's going to come next. That you're going to have a pastor that's going to turn the heat up, talk about hell, and do some condemning. And some, that's why you get the floppy Bible that you can spin and shake at people and go, hey, you're a sinner. But that's not what Jesus is about. The word sin, it troubles us. We usually think of it as a list of things that we're not supposed to do, that, that the Bible is simply a rule book that go, here, look, here are the things to take life out of life for you. Don't do these things. Or we think it's um, by withholding things that we should do. Now, both of those are accurate. There are things that we shouldn't do, and there are things that we should do. But sin is more complex and complicated than that. Sin is the break that happens in our relationship when we stop centering our lives on loving God and loving others. It, that encompasses everything. It covers every sin that you can imagine. When we stop centering our lives on loving God and loving others, that, that is a break in a relationship. A break in the relationship we have with God, a break in the relationship we have with each other, the break in a relationship we have with creation. If our center is off, the rest will be off. And so if our life is not centered on Jesus Christ and we shift the center over here to ourself, the wheel is not going to work like it's supposed to. And the center gets off, that's when we get in trouble. The rest of our life will be off. We're in for a bumpy ride. And let's face it, the road, it's already rocky. And so Lord, help us. When we're off center, this is when we grab onto the things that we think can make us feel good in the moment. That is when we try to tend to lean, lean on our vices. That's why when, um, when we're most tired and exhausted, we go to the things that are least helpful to us. Um, if I say comfort food, how many of those are in the, uh, the pyramid of health? <laughs> not many. Chinese food might taste good. It's not good for you. It's comforting. Lots of pasta, lots of cake, lots of ice cream. 
We lean on our vices. And those are the, you know, not, not even the worst of it. And there's the other things that we lean on. So when we get stressed and anxiety and our center gets off, what we lean on is the thing to go to. And if our center isn't centered, we're more likely to grab onto those things that end up causing us more harm. But it also works with our virtues too. We lean, I remember uh, there was a, a, a songwriter I, I loved, uh, Rich Mullins, and he says we need to repent not just of our, our vices but our virtues as well because when we become ultra virtuous, we become like those in the synagogue that were praying out loud and uh, look for and get the rewards of look what I've done, look what I've given, look, look who I am, look how righteous I am. And we begin to think that we can earn our way into the arms of God's love. And that's simply not the case. What we do with our virtues is we end up perverting the good things and we make them bad things. That's why just about every sin, the root of it, the actual action, there's actually good there. But it's a perversion of something good. So talking about sin is uncomfortable because we feel exposed and that's the nature of sin. It's desires to stay in the shadows and the dark and tell you lies about what it is. That if they only knew if God, what God really sees in you, they'll never embrace you. That God will never love you because he can see what I am. And so we want to hide from that. And so we creep and sin whispers on our ears that don't admit this. Because if you admit this, then you'll have to face the reality of how broken and twisted it, um, you are. No one's going to want to be around that. And that's the insidiousness of sin. Because it lies to you with the truth. The sin, it prevents renewal. Because what we think is that if I, that we think about Ash Wednesday and we think about admitting our sins and confessing and repentance, we think it's, oh, oh, woe is me, God, let me tear my clothes, let me pour dirt on my head, let me um, just weep and moan and cry at how miserable of a worm I am. God's going, that doesn't, that's not doing me any favors. And it may be true that we're broken and it may be true that we're, we're exhausted and lost, but that's not God's goal. He doesn't want us to grovel. He wants us to live. That's the goal. That's the hope that Jesus Christ has for to live. And so we've made the mistake in the past of the church by bringing condemnation down on the sinner, condemnation down on ourselves. But what did Jesus say? I didn't come to condemn the world. And he says this right after he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish. I didn't come to condemn the world. And if you unpack that scripture, what it's saying is the world is condemning itself already. Come to the light. Shine a light on this so that you can be freed from this. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He doesn't point at the sin in our lives to condemn, but to liberate. That's why I love the story about the... uh, I hate that we call this the story of the woman caught in adultery. Like, what's up with the dude? (laughs) Like, it was a one kind of person thing. This is a story about the two people caught in adultery with double standards and the man gets away with it and the woman's shamed. That's what the story's about. And Jesus says, if you have stones, then you can throw it. And the men drop their stones and they walk away. And he looks at her and he doesn't condemn her, but he names her and he sees her as a person. He walks he says, woman, who stands to condemn you? No one, and neither do I. And then he says, now go and live out of that freedom. In other words, he says, go and sin no more. But the passion there is like, I love you, your person. Live out of that. Too often what we do is we think I have to get my life straight and stop sinning so that God can love me. And God says, I don't want any of that. I love you. Live your life out of that love. And then you will learn how to live without sin. A rich young ruler came up to Jesus. Remember the story? And he said, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, all the Ten Commandments. He says, oh, I do all those. And I, I do, you know, he probably went on to say, look, I, I do all of the Levitical laws, even the ones that contradict themselves. I do all of those. I, and I'm, I'm living out as best I can. And Jesus says, all right, sell everything you have and follow me. And he walks away sad. Sometimes we look at this as a condemnation on money, and I, I don't think that's the heart of it. The problem wasn't the stuff. Jesus didn't have a problem with that. It was the idea of mine. The man had a hold of stuff, and the stuff had a hold on the man. And that's what it is with our stuff, our sin, the things. It gets a hold of us. It gets in us. 
One thing I love about the story is there's so much to unpack in it, but it, it's to look at the person who has, so often what we do is we look at the person that has nothing and go, of course you need Jesus. Or we look at the person that's a real sinner and we go, of course you need Jesus. This is what we used to think conversion was, isn't it? I, I stop doing bad things, I start doing good things. I was once a bad person, now I'm a good person. And that's part of conversion. But what about for this guy who seems to be doing everything great? I mean, he didn't want to sell all this stuff, but do any of you? But he was given probably 10%. He was doing all the things. So where's the salvation for him if that's not good enough? You notice what his question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think there's a key in there. What is conversion? This guy seems to, he goes away sad, yet he seems to have everything. So where's the good news for him? In the beginning, in Genesis, uh, we're told that God saw what he created and said it was good. Not only was it good, it was tov mahod. Was pretty sure I'm getting this Hebrew right. Forcefully good. That meant God said this is Wonderful. He delighted in it, in the balance of it, the relationship between God, creation, God and humanity, humanity with humanity, humanity and creation, all of it, tov mahov, forcefully good. It was a wheel delicately balanced, spinning like it's supposed to. Humans, nature, humans with each other, humans with God. A.W. Tozer, he talks about how before God created man, he created all kinds of wonderful things, things that we could use for life, beautiful things for the eyes and, and uh, for the, the, the touch, the taste, the ears, all of them created for use for men and women. These things were referred to as things, he says. And he says that they were made for humanity's uses, but they were meant always to be external to the human and subservient to us. They, along with human were the wheel. That's, that's it. They were, we were part of this wheel, and at the heart of the human was a shrine that were only one that could truly feel that would be God. If this is our life, that God is that center here, and that's the shrine where Jesus Christ dwells. God dwells right there in that. But when we wander from that center and we shift the shrine, the voice of the snake and the creation stories, it changes. It says, okay, wait, don't put God at the center. Put you at the center. You can be God. Balance was gone. The first balance to go was with the self. You ever notice that when you read Genesis? That first balance to go was the balance with the self. They suddenly were realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. It wasn't just that they were naked, but they were ashamed of that what God had called good. You see? And then fear happened. That's new. Fear. So they hid what God had created good. Now, this isn't a proposal that for nudist. I don't want you to hear that. But hear the creation, the perversion of something good. The next relationship, they wanted to hide there. Then the relationship between Man and woman deteriorated right there because the balance was off-centered. And what happened? God said, what's up, guys? And the man said what? Woman! (laughs) She made me do it. Like, and the woman said, no, no, it was a snake. No one could take responsibility for themselves. The nature that fell apart Family, Cain and Abel, and the communities, then war, all in the name of mine and possessions because we weren't satisfied not being God and enjoying what God had given to us. And we moved our center, and God being our center, to us being on the outside, to us being the center. And it shifted. That wheel was awful. We became a people of possession and possessed by our possessions. Our ideas of the self have become bricks, building our own heart kingdoms, and in many ways, very physical kingdoms, and we became a people of obsession and possession. 
And the problem with building our own kingdom, our own identity, our own external, external possessions, as well as the turning the idea of someone else into a possess, possession, because that's what we do in relationship. Like, oh, you complete me, you're mine, I can't live without you. Is that our external possessions and identity become vulnerable to external attacks. And when they get torn apart and they break down, they never satisfy. They can never be the center. And we hide from the best parts of ourselves when we're hiding from the worst parts of ourselves. That's the thing. That's why recognizing sin, if we can confront it, we can discover the best parts of ourselves again. But when we hide from it, we try to put in the... Uh, listen, I took my daughter to see her mom uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and I'd forgotten that she ate a banana and put it in a plastic bag in my car. The other day, I remembered the banana, not because I remembered the banana, but the banana reminded me that it was there. I was like, I got in the car, I was like, something doesn't smell right. <laughs> That's what hiding our sin does. We become defensive and broken in relationship with self and others dissolves. And when life is tough, and life is tough, it becomes problematic. Look at this past year, COVID, racial disparity, riots, political unrest, death, isolation, loneliness. The road is troubled. And I imagine our center has been shaking quite a bit. And we've forgotten what it is that gives us peace and gives us life. And we're clinging on to whatever it is we can hold on to. And it's usually our ego, our fear, our anxiety, grabbing on, trying to make sense of this. And Jesus is saying, be still and know that I am God. Let me be your center. Let me be your center. And that's what Ash Wednesday is. That's what Lynn is. It's recentering. It's remembering, oh, I don't have to be the center anymore. It's not a condemnation of you being a center. It's relief. It's liberation to say, you no longer have to be the center. You can let me be your center. Let me be your stronghold. Let me be the core of your life and your wheel. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, be reconciled to God for our sake he made his self, his son become sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the good news for us. The good news is not a formula. It's not a tool to help build our kingdom. Jesus is the one come back into our life to restore our balance, to take place in our soul. And we have placed so many other possessions, and he's saying, let me just move those over here. Let me recenter you in me. Where we have said success, you become the measure of salvation. Revenge, you become my measure of salvation. Or getting rich, getting a family, getting married, getting recognized, getting the girl, getting the guy, whatever it might be. When we've said that's been the center for our salvation, Jesus comes in and says, no, let me be your center of salvation. Whatever brick we're trying to build our kingdom, God became flesh, lived the perfect life we are called to live, died the death we were supposed to die, and then rose from the dead that we might live. And in so doing, he began to recreate creation, recreate what was meant to happen in the garden and beginning by replacing our kingdoms that are slowly and deceptively destroying us. You see, Jesus calling us to look at our sin is not to condemn us. This 40 days is not about groveling before God so that he deems us sorry enough to be forgiven. He doesn't need anything from us. Jesus asks us to look at our sin and ask for forgiveness so that we can be free, that we can recenter on God and live a life of light that we're created for. So tonight is a call to repentance. And I want to tell you this about repentance. Sometimes we think repentance is saying we're sorry and about forgiveness. There's so much more than that. I've shared this with you before. I'm going to share it with you again because I know we need reminding. Repentance is simply this. I'm walking this way. I'm going to repent. So I'm going to walk a different way. <laughs> it's saying, I've been going in this direction. Being forgiven and saying, I'm sorry, is going this way. Tripping and going, I'm going to try not to trip again, but I'm going to still walk this way. Repentance is about changing direction, living into a new reality. And so Jesus is saying, repent, rescind to your world. Repentance is recognizing your tire is bent and you need a new way home. And tonight is about getting realigned. So we'll have ashes here placed on our heads to remind us that we're sinners and we've forgotten to center our lives on God and loving others. And we put ashes on our head to remember our baptism. 
that we live out of the love of Christ, not the condemnation of Christ. When we get centered, we get free, we get life. And so what I want to encourage you over this next 40 days is not just to abstain some, from something. That's great. If you need to abstain from a certain food or you do a media fast or um, I, I, I was uh, sharing this the other day that I, I once uh, um, gave up sarcasm for Lent. Hardest Lent I ever did in my life because <laughs> people are ridiculous because <laughs> it's not about me. But it was also very fruitful because what I learned in that was what can I put in place? And so if you're abstaining from something, that's great. But God, remember, He doesn't just require sacrifice. No, He wants mercy, grace. What can you replace that emptiness with? So maybe try reading a chapter of Scripture a day for the next 40 days. Maybe you spend time praying every day for the next 40 days. Maybe you find a way to be generous to someone you've never been generous before or uh, think of other people. Find something, way to act like Jesus over the next 40 days. That is an act of repentance. And that is an act of liberation. And that is an act of hope. And so this evening, as we move into the next part of our our service, we're going to move into a time of uh, um, reflection, and Rachel's going to lead us in in an invitation here in a moment. And uh, what I want to say is at home, we're going to be doing our imposition of ashes outside, and I'll say that again toward the end. And at home, what I would encourage you to do is at the end, and I'll remind you of this as well, is that you'll use that water to remember your baptism, to remember that, and baptism is also a sign of of dying to an old self and coming alive to the new self, of realigning. And so that's what that water at home is for. Hear the invitation. Hear the invitation. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, The early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. To make a right beginning of repentance, and as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now bow before our Creator and Redeemer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes and this water may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In a moment, uh, Jim is going to lead us in a hymn. And uh, Rachel and I will work our way outside. It's a little dark. Um, and, uh, um, but what's going to happen is we have two different stations, one on the right and one on the left. And the ushers will um, dismiss you from the back to the, to the front. Um, and we'll come out there. And if you 
Rachel and I will either uh, can Im impose the ashes on you if you'd like, but if you would like to, as a family, impose the ashes on each other, um, you're welcome to do that, and, and we'll share that with you, and we'll give you a blessing as you go out for the evening. At home, we invite you to, uh, with your water, simply at this time, to take your hand and reach in to the water, place it on your forehead, remember your baptism, and be thankful. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. I invite you to please stand and follow the usher's direction for dismissal. <laughs>